All right, so our next speaker is Jan Hoffman about automatic resource bound analysis and linear optimization. Yeah, so um, this is something completely different. Um, and uh, I, I uh, work in, in programming languages, so I guess uh, this counts as an, an application here. Um, and so the, the title, or at least part of the title of this workshop is beyond worst case analysis and analysis. I mean, we usually mean analysis of algorithms. And then when I say resource-bound analysis, I mean analysis of programs, of software, which is in some sense very similar, in some other sense also very different. Um, from, from analysis of algorithms. So um, I give you a little bit of motivation. Why are we interested in resource usage of, of programs? So first of all, there are safety critical systems and resource usage is a very important problem there. So you remember, for instance, this um, unintended acceleration in Toyota cars where your car would just speed up uh, you can't break anymore. People died because of this issue. Uh, there was a lawsuit, and an expert witness related this problem to uh, stack overflow. So this is uh, related to memory usage. Another example I have here is, is about timing. So the e EC3 train was produced by Siemens in, in, in Germany. And um, the delivery of the train was delayed for over a year because of timing issues with, with the software. If you would hit the brake, it would take more than one second until the signal gets sent from the software to the actual brake. This was considered to be unsafe, uh, had to be fixed. Um, but even outside um, uh, safety critical systems, resource usage is, of course, um, very important. So um, uh, you see, like in a lot of like systems and big systems, you see uh, performance bugs. So um, for instance, there was this healthcare.gov website that you might remember that was a total disaster. It had many issues, but uh, one of the main issues was yeah, that like, uh, it, it was too slow. Um, another um, example I have is from a project I do with Google. Um, there we work with a, a team that is doing the back end of the, the Google apps. And they have um, fairly regularly issues when they you know, change the code. Um, that they, you know, um, and they ship it to their servers and then um, they run out of resources. So they want to run their servers at like a very high capacity. And if the like, you know, say memory usage goes up a little bit, then the servers start failing. And they can run regression tests overnight, but they cannot run a performance regression tests. So what they have to do is literally do like a binary search of the changes they made to the code to find out what caused like the, the increase in, in memory usage. So. Um, Finally, um, so the, also very important, um, this problem of resource usage and uh, software security. So there are um, a lot of vulnerabilities based on resource usage. So I have uh, selected two here. One is called um, algorithmic complexity vulnerabilities, where an attacker can trigger an unusual worst case behavior in your system. So for instance, you, know, you have a server and you use a, a, a hash table. Uh, 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 and an attacker could send packets, they get all hashed in the same buckets, and the server gets very slow, it can't do its job anymore. Some say like input of death or, or something, it's like a, a word for that. The other thing is like side channels, um, where an attacker can learn uh, secret information from the uh, resource behavior of, of uh, the program. So that can be like time usage, like you know, when you compare password character by character, you know, you can see how many uh, you hit, and you can even learn then the password over, over the network. Another thing is like when you have um, um, uh, size of um, encrypted packets. Um, uh, that somebody can observe, and this is like a fingerprint, you know, um, of the things you clicked on in, 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 in your form. And that's another project we're doing um, with DARPA that's actually a, a fairly large um, um, DARPA program um, where they specifically look at these two problems and, you know, give us software and we have to find these vulnerabilities. So. Um, so the, 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 the problem we're looking at is very similar to analysis of algorithms. So we have given a program P, and we would like to know what is the worst case resource consumption as a function um, of the sizes of the inputs and a resource. You know, can we clock cycle, heap space, energy usage? Um, and in these um, um, yeah, more motivating examples I mentioned, uh, you see that like um, um, asymptotic uh, bounds are not good enough. You want concrete constant factor, preferably on concrete hardware. And um, this is kind of like similar uh, as what Don Knuth does in, in the art of computer programming, where he also has like concrete constant factors for the SMIPS architecture. But I mean, you can't ask a developer to do like such an analysis for the code. So we would like to do that automatically. And of course, this is an, an undecidable problem. But you know, the, the goal is to come up with some 
technology that works well for a lot of programs, and particularly for programs that people write in practice. So the um, research challenges here are, um, um, you know, very different from analysis of algorithms. So we, you know, um, usually don't analyze, you know, a program that contains a new algorithm for, you know, graph isomorphism or something like that. You know, the, the programs we have are um, um, very simple, but, you know, we have to deal with things like, you know, compilation with uh, hardware caches and, you know, library code and, and, and runtime systems. So, and uh, this is in general like more about the um, mechanics, compositionality, you know, of, of things and not so much um, of having um, very complicated algorithms implemented. Um, so, um, yeah, one thing um, um, that, that, that is um, um, very important is to ensure that these automatic analyses are uh, compositional in the sense that, like, you know, if it works for one function and another function, you know, and you plug these functions together and there's some size change in your data, you know, that you um, uh, can still uh, get it, get get it, get a, uh, 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 automatically get a bound for those. And another thing we have to uh, work with is you know complex language features, concurrency, a higher order data structure. So these are like the the main challenges. So um, you know thinking about and uh, about yeah how how they're related to to the workshop. So I mentioned already if you interpret the title as you know being beyond worst case analysis of algorithms. So okay here you look at you know worst case analysis of of programs and the challenges are yeah. Uh, kind of like very, very different. But um, there are two other um, kind of like uh, uh, points here I want to make. So uh, one is um, that uh, we face um, similar challenges um, um, that like you face um, when, when you, when, when you, when you um, describe a worst case bound, you know, then like, you know, people come to us and say like, okay, the data that we have, you know, we don't see this worst case behavior. We want, you know, something other than, than worst case and it's a bit unclear what that is. So um, that's what I was hoping to find here, you know, some uh, inspiration of, you know, what, what that could be and so, that's what I find very interesting about the workshop. Um, there is um, another connection. So when um, we all like in, in the technique that I use, where, when I do the automatic bound analysis, we reduce the problem of bound analysis to LP solving. And there we have such an instance where the behavior we see in, in practice is much better than the worst case behavior. So we use simplex, but the, um, so the, the worst case would be exponential, but the instances um, of the linear programs that we generate um, have usually a, a linear behavior. So um, they, they can be solved in, in linear time in practice. So there's like an instance where you wanna have, you know, in the analysis of our system, um, yeah, where, where you wanna have something that goes beyond worst case analysis. Okay, good. So, um, yeah, that's a, a quick motivation um, to, to give you a bit of an, of an idea what, what this is all about. So, um, I want to go um, a bit into the technicalities of this analysis, you know, how we do that, how we get the bounds. Um, I, I can only, you know, um, um, give you, um, touch on a few points to give you an idea um, um, of, of how, how we do that. Um, and then um, I want to hopefully convince you um, that this works um, surprisingly well in, in, in practice. So we have an implementation and, you know, i show you a bit of how, how that works on concrete examples. And um, uh, finally, I um, talk a bit about the linear programs that we get from, from the analysis. Okay, so um, just uh, really quickly, here's uh, what, what we want to do. So we start with some source code. We want to get like a symbolic resource bound. Yeah, something like that here. Uh, a formula that depends on the input sizes, but we have to take into account the compiler um, and the, the runtime system. And we do that um, by defining a formal cost semantics of the program at, at the high level. We then do our automatic analysis and we do, um, interestingly, a, a type-based analysis. So we do like some type inference and I'll explain that. We get a type derivation and um, uh, this type derivation can be seen as a proof of the bound. And you can even like, you know, attach that to your code and, and ship it with, with your code. And um, the um, benefit of the setup is that like, um, we can prove the analysis sound with respect to this uh, cost semantics here. So we have a you know very clear soundness theorem, um, and because it's a type system, it's very compositional, right? You can have like in in, in the type you can have a library, and in the types you see all the resource costs, and we have, as I said, this um, efficient LP solving. So. Um, 
The idea uh, of the analysis is to automate amortized analysis. So um, what we do is we, you know, you, uh, you can think of a program as, you know, having like states and transitions between the states. And at each state, we define a potential function that maps the memory at the state to a non-negative number. And for each transition in the program, we ensure that the potential at the starting state is sufficient to cover the cost of the transition and the potential at the next state. And if you do that for all the transitions in your program, then you know that the potential you have at the starting state of the program is an upper bound on uh, the cost of, of the execution, no matter what path you take through, through the program. Um, but now we want to automate this um, um, using a type system. So what we have to do is we have to, because we cannot you know, generate like in arbitrary potential functions, so what we have to do is we have to fix a format of these uh, potential functions. And this you can view as a basis, like in linear algebra, right? We want to use like a linear constraint solving to, to do this. Um, and then the type rules um, are like, you know, local manipulations of these constraints of the basis. Um, so that's a, 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 about how, how it works. And the potential is really given by the types in the system. So it sounds kind of complicated, but um, it is um, very intuitive. So let's look at an uh, uh, example. So here um, you have a pen for persistent lists. And let's say you know, we are interested in um, memory usage, heap space usage, right? So um, if you want to do this um, append, right, it's a persistence list, so we have to copy over um, here this uh, list x. And we say like, you know, for, for each list element, you know, we need two heap cells, one for the data, one for the pointer to the next. So how this will look is um, when, when we have here append x, y, is we walk through this list x and we copy it over, right? And um, here we have like length three, and uh, uh, this is the result of append, and um, um, three times two uh, is six, so six is a heap space usage um, of this program. And what I want to do now is, you know, I want to show you how we can reason about it with um, potential. But before I do that, um, I want to show you a slightly more interesting program here um, so that you can see uh, the compositionality of this thing. So here you have two calls to append, okay? First we append um, x to y, we get this list t, and then we um, append t to a list uh, z here. And um, so the, the bound, I mean, it's still like uh, you, you can do the math, it's not uh, uh, too hard, but as I said, we want to do this automatically. So now we have the uh, 2n, yeah, where n is the length <coughs> of x, and then we have 2n plus m, because that's the length of t. And it's already like a bit more complicated, because now you have to figure out you know, what the length of t is automatically. So how we do that is um, we introduce um, some potential for every element in the list. So here we're going to say like we have potential four for you know every element in, in the list x and potential two for every element in the list y and you know if you sum this up uh, this is exactly this four times n plus two times m the bound we we want to prove and if we want to prove this bound we kind of like statically walk through the program and kind of like think about how this program is executed um, and here so what's going to happen is we're going to like um, copy over uh, uh, this. Uh, node um, C here, where when we execute the append x, y, uh, and um, we have this potential for, so two of these potential units, you know, have to be used up to pay for the creation of this new node, and two are left over, and we can, you know, assign it to this new list uh, that we create here, and um, we do that uh, for, for the rest of the elements, and then, you know, we, we have this, uh, uh, new list here, T, that is the result of the first call. And now we have a list where we have two potential units per element in the list. Yeah, and now we can walk over this list here and can use um, this potential in the second call of append to pay for the cost. So this is um, how we set up the uh, uh, analysis. And you can see already, you know, that this um, is something that's easy to automate. At the beginning of the program, you don't know what it is, right? So you put like some unknown um, annotations here, and then you get, yeah, when you analyze the program text, some inequalities um, that tell you how much of this potential you need. Okay, so um, 
Yeah, what's interesting is um, that uh, you never, when you do this uh, analysis, you never have to think about the sizes of the, the data structure. So that's all implicit in, 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 in the analysis. And um, that's why, why it's easy to automate. So and if you um, uh, uh, want to formalize that, so you can use a type system for it, you can do like different things, but here um, you have the type of append, you know, just as like uh, you, you have two lists and you um, uh, create a list, and then um, for this first call of append, you want to have this potential annotation four, and then for the first list and potential annotation two for the second list, and what you get is a list with annotation two here. Um, and for the second call, uh, you need a different type, but you only have two potential units, uh, units attached uh, to, to every element here in the first list, and then um, everything is used up. In general, um, you um, can summarize the type by having like unknown annotations and a set of uh, linear constraints here. Um, and depending on the call side, you uh, need to have a different type. Something like quadratic behavior or log n type of thing, when the values that you need to guess need to depend both on some constants and the length of the list or whatever data structures you yes. have. How can you sort of you know recognize which situation I'm in? Because one of them is a growing quantity, and yes. how do you know how to exactly? You know? I'll come to that. I mean, the trick is here already. You take into account the length of the list. I mean, I'll come to, to um, polynomial things in a moment, but that's an important point here. I mean, we say like, you know, you have two um, um, potential elements per element in the list, so you have two times n already. But that, it's a linear behavior. Yeah, 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 so and, so. and so that's exactly, you know, um, thanks for, for asking this question, so that's exactly the, the thing I want to talk about next, is so how can we, you know, extend this um, to polynomials. So that works like very well for like, you know, a linear bounds, you get this compositionality, LP solving and so on. And the um, interesting uh, thing is, the same thing can work for multivariate polynomial bounds. So, um, um, oh yeah, another point I want to make, I, sh I showed how this works for, for, for heap space here. But you can really do the same thing for every resource metric that you give me, for every you know constant cost you give me um, um, for like additions, multiplications, or whatever constructs you have in, in, in your programming language. It's parametric in that. And um, so, I, I, yeah. Next, I will talk about like how we can do the same thing for um, polynomial behavior. And um, yeah, this is something that that's relatively new, and we can even do things like you know m times n squared, like these multivariate things, and, and much more than that, really. Um, um, to say it works for, for polynomial is a bit of an, an, an understatement. So, um, okay, so uh, just start with an example. So let's say, um, maybe not so quick, uh, let's say um, we have quicksort. Um, and quicksort, of course, like has some uh, quadratic behavior. And now we have a program where we first append to lists and then feed it into quicksort. So the bound you get at the end is already fairly complicated. So you know you have like these mixed factors here, you know, because it's uh, quadratic and, and, and uh, m plus n. So that's a bound you get here. Um, I think I look at a um, number of evaluation steps, and that's a bound we automatically derive with, with our system. So. How this will look in the system, I said, like it's it's a bit like linear algebra, right? Where you now have um, multiple annotations for a list. So here, for instance, you have you know um, something linear, something you know this is a, the uh, well this is a constant one here actually. This is the linear one you've seen before, and this is the quadratic one. So the um, quadratic one here is actually um, a binomial coefficient because these binomial coefficients behave very nicely under like discrete derivation. And that's what you need in the system when you, you know, have size changes in your data structures. And you see also here you have um, kind of like a different basis depending on the data. So here, you know, you have a, a pair of lists. So in our type system, you have like all these different factors here, you know, for like uh, linear and n, linear and m, uh, quadratic and n, this mixed one here, uh, quadratic and m. And this is kind of like the basis you have for, for this particular type. And the system automatically kind of like discovers this convolution formula for binomial coefficients. So this is nothing we, you know, put into the system that's just like in these local linear constraints and the system kind of like discovered this in the, in the type inference. 
um, uh, which, which I think is, is uh, uh, remarkable. And um, yeah, so the, if, if you have already, you know, this bound for quick sort, then kind of like this is the bound you, you, you get for, 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 for your whole program. Um, yeah, I wanna, um, so this is just to, to give you a bit of an impression. And of course you wanna have like, you know, certain algebraic properties um, for, for your basis. And so it's, a, it's an interesting question, you know, what function set to pick for, for this basis. So the main thing you wanna have is that you have like a good way of, you know, expressing that your potential is non-negative. And we usually do that by just having um, um, non-negative coefficients in our like cone. Uh, 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 that we have. And the other thing you want is you want good closure properties. So when, you, when the sizes of your data structures change, you know, so um, if you have quadratic potential, you get like a linear spill that you can later use up. And so you wanna produce simple linear constraints. So you, you wanna have like a, a, a good function set. And what we developed is this um, sigma pi formula where you kind of like in your data structure, you sum up over all order tuples that you can form. And then for each tuple, you can have again like um, um, a polynomial cost. So the simplest form of that is where you just say for each tuple, you have some constant cost. Um, and then you get the binomial coefficients. But you can have more complex stuff. So here I have like a, a few examples. Um, what, what are resource polynomials? Um, um, so one thing you can, for instance, get is um, something like this. So this is a bound you get for a sorting algorithm where each comparison takes linear time. So then um, you get the sum over all the pairs you can form with your list. And for each pair, um, you have a, a, a linear cost. Okay, questions so far? What about logarithmic behavior? Yeah, logarithmic behavior is, um, that, that, that's something that's um, um, very complicated to get. I mean, you can set up an, an analysis that works well, let's say, you know, for merge sort that gives you an n log n bound. But then if you wanna have this compositionality, um, this is very difficult to get when you have logar logarithmic factors. Um, because here for, for polynomial, I mean, it's, you have, you have this nice closure property that, you know, the result of a polynomial computation is a polynomial, you can plug it in again, you, you get a polynomial. And with, with a logarithm, it's, it's not quite like that. Also like when you get the spill, yeah, if you have something quadratic or quadratic potential, you make it smaller, get the linear spill and so on. Um, for, for, the, for the logarithm, I mean, what, what you get is not uniform in some size that you have, you get something like, you know, one over N and we don't quite know what, what to do with it. So we have a few ideas what to do for, for logarithmic, but we don't have a, a good solution. Exponential, interestingly, is easy. Um, that works well, very well, but logarithmic is, is very hard to, to get. Yeah. Exponential, you could set up log n to be your basic thing. And yeah, well, yeah, we, 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 yeah, we tried that, but um, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's something we work on right now. I mean, you can, uh, you, you can have some solutions. So, I mean, something we were like also like experimenting with is if you just add like a new variable to the program that's just like a ghost variable and that's just, you know, always like log n um, um, for, 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 for some list and you maintain it in, in the program. I mean, that, that would be also like a way to, to get it, but yeah, I'm not too happy with it. Um, so, yeah, I would say it's still like an, an, an open question. Yeah, other questions? Yeah, so now to, to, to automate the, the analysis, what you have to do is you fix um, a maximal degree of, of your bounds so that you, you know, get like a, um, a finite basis um, for, for, for every type. And then um, you um, um, attach like to, to, you know, your type derivation, if you want, um, unknown coefficients to, you know, all, all your types. And then you have type rules. So here, for instance, um, I did that. Yeah, we have like this pair of lists and um, some uh, uh, coefficients. Um, and then um, uh, you kind of like um, get uh, uh, these linear constraints depending on you know what you do with your your um, uh, data. Yeah, and that like uh, we solve with an LP solver, and of course we minimize um, in, in the objective the initial potential. It's nice you can even um, say like, okay, you want to first minimize you know the cubic coefficients, and then um, um, you do like this iterative solving at a new objective, and you know um, solve the uh, at a new constraint 
um, based on, on um, uh, the objective you got, and then you, you, you solve the quadratic ones and linear ones. So that works um, really nicely and efficiently. OK, yeah, so I, yeah. Um, there, there, there will be much more to talk about, for instance, you know, when you go beyond lists, when you have user-defined um, um, types, tree-like stuff, and so on. But yeah, I, I want to like um, uh, move on and um, uh, show you how the, the uh, system works and, and what, what we can do with it. Um, more questions about the technical stuff? OK, so we implement the system um, for a subset of um, OCaml. So this is like a, a, it, it's a real project. So um, uh, we have um, 12,000 uh, uh, 12, lines of code um, uh, right now. And um, yeah, we use um, um, CLP uh, from the Coinor project as our, our solver. Sometimes we also use Cplex, but we found they are like both um, pretty comparable on the simple constraints um, um, that we have. We support a lot of um, language features. So I mentioned user-defined inductive types. You have higher order function. We have parallel evaluation, something I didn't talk about, side effects I didn't talk about. Um, um, and we can also do lower bounds with, with this analysis, which is um, interesting for some of these applications. Um, you can try this out online. Um, um, find the link on my, my web page. So here, um, I have two uh, sets of benchmarks here. The, this is what I call micro benchmarks, where we just you know, implement some textbook algorithms with, with the system. So here, uh, you see, for instance, quicksort. Um, the derived bound is like a, a quadratic bound. Um, and here, you see the um, performance of the analysis. So um, you see it's uh, pretty fast. The numbers here are, are a bit outdated. I think now um, they probably would take all um, um, under one second here um, in, with, with the current version. Um, yeah, you can um, have relatively complex things. So here's like a, this insertion sort where you have like a linear um, comparison. So this is like, you know, sorting of strings. Um, here you have Dijkstra's um, um, shortest pass algorithm, um, um, quicksort with arrays, um, in-place quicksort. And um, yeah, uh, uh, um, these are like the typical examples. So oh yeah, what, what we um, then of course, what we proved is that these bounds are sound. Um, but um, we don't know if, if, if these bounds are tight. Um, so it could be, you know, that like, um, I mean, I already mentioned that all, all, usually what you get is something that's um, asymptotically tight or often, um, 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 if, we, if we can express it, if it's polynomial. Um, but then the question is, how good are the constant factors? And so what we did is, you know, we um, here, this is all for, for like um, steps in our like semantics. Um, and what, what we did is we um, um, implemented like an interpreter that, you know, just counts the steps as you run the program and we feed it like worst case input. So for quick sort, like a reversely sorted list and the red um, dots is what we measure when we run it with like our, our worst case examples and the blue line is the bound that we derive. So for these like high level things like steps, you get tight bounds. Um, um, for, 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 for many of the functions. So this is quicksort here. Um, here's longest come subsequence. Again, these blue lines, um, that's uh, the bound we, we derived, and the red dots is what we measured. Uh, there, it's you know, pretty similar what you get for like an, an, an uh, input of a, of a fixed size. Um, it does not depend so much on it. Um, here you have insertion sort. Um, again, you, you get well, for, for these strings. Um, again, you get like a very, very good bound um, for that. Um, okay, so the, the other um, benchmarks we did is like when you just you know, get some existing code and you know, run it like on a, on, on a larger uh, code base. So um, yeah, we did that like for um, a couple of things. For instance, you know, the standard list library, uh, we can automatically analyze most of the functions. Or here, um, this is like a, a C compiler written in, 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 in OCaml. Um, this is an interesting um, project anyways, because it's a, a, a verified C compiler. So it's not written in OCaml initially. It's written in the uh, Cork proof assistant. And then the code is extracted to OCaml. So this is an optimizing C compiler that's proved to be correct. This is a C compiler with no bugs. Um, and um, the, uh, the advantage we get from this is that the code is very regular, so it works very well with, with our tool. I mean, you can't, of course, expect, you know, if you have a, 
um, 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 function, let's say, you know, like bubble sort that contains something, okay, while the list is, you know, not sorted, do something. I mean, this is something where we have to give up. But if you have something where you have, you know, in every function, you know, is some size um, uh, decrease before the recursive call, you know, these are the things um, um, we can deal with very well. Um, and that's um, what you get from, from this um, camel thing. So, um, yeah, so you, um, yeah, like in, in, in often, I mean, if you know you have like a language fragment that we uh, support, you get like um, pretty good results. So um, and also the the bounds um, um, you get are, are often asymptotically tight, and the the constant factors are also um, um, pretty good. So this is something um, I envision can like could like really be you know um, integrated into to to like you know. Um, 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 uh, Realistic environment where, where they use the camel, where they get feedback uh, at compilation time. Okay, um, I, one thing I um, don't want to talk about, but I want to mention it um, uh, quickly. Is so what I have shown you is like how this works for like these high-level things, like you know number of allocations, steps. But what we are often interested in is, of course things like clock cycles, and how can we make this connection? And so um, this is something we did like um, very recently um, where we use machine learning um, to kind of like find out, okay, what's the uh, um, average time an addition takes um, um, at the high level um, um, for the compiled code? Of course, it's like a, a kind of difficult question to answer because you have cache effects, instruction pipelines, these things. But if you say like, okay, you know, we just wanna know what the average is to give the developer an idea um, um, at the end, you know, you can just say like we take a few, you know, uh, uh, programs, example inputs, you know, um, um, we set up like this um, 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 interpreter that just counts the number of additions, and then you know we use linear regression to fit the curve of like you know um, um, this constant for 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 addition with the thing we measured on some particular hardware, and this is then what we can feed into our analysis as a cost semantics, you know, to predict uh, the execution time of new programs, and um, uh, this works fairly well. I mean, if you think about like how uh, crazy it is um, um, to do something like that because you have these cache effects and so on, um, it works surprisingly well. So here's one of the um, um, examples that are uh, not that great. It, it, it's a pen, and it's not that great because you have a lot of memory operations going on for a pen. So the 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 whole um, cost for the execution of a pen is basically the the cost for the memory operations as you create this new list, and you have garbage collection, right? So garbage collection. This is what 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 happens here, and the blue thing is is what we predict, and the. Um, here, these are our like measurements. We measure 500 times, and this um, um, in this like little box here is the second and third uh, quartile um, of the measurements. And so, if you have like you know a function like quicksort, this um, looks much better because you have less you know memory uh, 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 going on, uh, memory operations going on um, compared to the to the runtime. <clears throat> okay, so um, after how much time do I have? Five more. Yeah, okay, that's good then. So yeah, questions about this uh, machine learning stuff? Um, yeah, this is something that's uh, fairly new that, 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 that we are doing right now. Um, so, um, okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about um, was um, the LP instances uh, 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 that we get. So that's also like a um, thing that you know, might be interesting for, for some of you. Um, so the instances we get are almost um, network flow problems, um, but not quite. So um, yeah, just a, as a reminder, so these um, network flow constraints, how do they look? Um, they always say like, okay, you have you know, some um, uh, edges xi, you know, where you have uh, some flow in, inside your node, uh, uh, and then you have like this xj, you know, these are like the edges that you know, flow out of your node, and then you can also have these like sources or sinks where you, you know, can like have a constant, um, um, where you can you know, um, either like, you know, um, um, get some flow out of the system or some constant flow into the system can be positive or negative. I don't know which one is in and out, but... Um, uh, not so important. Um, and uh, uh, the other thing you have are these um, 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 bounds, you know, on the on the flow capacity. So this li and ui here are constants. Let's say you know how much flow uh, you have to 
uh, send through and uh, you, you are allowed to send through so often this um, li will just be zero. Um, okay, and the, um, uh, yeah, so and I, I said like the constraints we get are um, kind of similar and um, so if you just think of like, you know, you would have a, a, a program, you know, where you just have straight line code. You know, you have like, you know, some like additions and that would um, um, look as follows. So you have like, you know, at every line, you have some potential Q, right? And then you have some cost C and at the next line, you have some, you know, Q prime. Um, so basically, um, this is exactly what, what, you, what, what, what you get from, from this um, um, network flow. Um, but then when, when you look at programs, um, things are like a bit um, more complicated. So here this looks like um, when, when you have size change in your program, for instance, you know, you, we had these lists, you know, where you have like this uh, potential uh, that becomes available when you, you know, shorten the list by one, you get this potential out, you can use it up. So that would be like a constraint that looks like this one here, um, where we uh, say like, okay, um, the potential, you know, when the list gets smaller, the constant potential is the old constant potential plus this linear spill you get out of the list. So um, it looks like one of these network um, um, constraints, but it's a bit different in the sense that these ed this edge you get from this like linear potential, if that would be your, your network, you kind of like um, allow the flow to fork basically and you don't have to split it up. So the, the linear potential flows into the um, um, list that got one shorter, but it also flows into the constant potential for the next one. So you have kind of like this, this fork, so it's a bit different. I'm not sure if you would um, 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 count that as a network flow constraint, but maybe you would, um, I don't know. Is, and uh, another thing you get in the uh, recursive call, so that's also a bit different from, from a network flow, is you wanna say basically when you, when you do the recursive call, you wanna kind of like close the loop. So you wanna say like, okay, and now again, you have the same potential as at the beginning of the function. So you can you know, just recursively do this uh, uh, cost accounting. So you would have something like P equals Q, and in the network that would also be a little bit weird. So you would have like the potential you know, flowing out of a node and then flowing all into the same node again. So that's how, how it would look um, um, in a network. Um, another thing you have here that's different from network flow is a conditional branch. So here you can, and that's why you get worst case balances, here you can have kind of like a, a waste of potential, right? So you have like um, now, um, think of like you have this constant potential again, you know, at every line, and now you have a, a, a fork in your program, a conditional, and then you wanna say like, okay, the constant potential you have here must be sufficient, you know, to cover for the cost in the first branch, and it also has to be sufficient to cover for the cost in the second branch. But if the cost is different, you know, well, then, you know, that's why it's a worst case bound. So on one branch, you have a little bit of waste. So that's also different from, 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 from the uh, uh, network flow. But you know, it's, it's um, similar enough. Um, and um, um, so I wanna skip over uh, this, this little few details. Um, the, the, the thing that's really different is um, a bit of a, a technicality. So if you have like this um, function g here, let's say you know it has some quadratic cost, yeah, g x y has cost ten times size of x times uh, size of y, assume it's lists again or something, and um, now you call this function g here um, by using like the same variable x twice here, okay? And now you have in, in the situation where you want to like express this cost here um, x squared in terms of these um, binomials here. So you have to ha do kind of like, you know, uh, uh, that's if you want the price you pay for selecting the, the binomial coefficients at the basis. So uh, you wouldn't have a lot of work here, you know, if, if this would be like the standard basis. But um, here we have to do a little bit of work because we now have to express this Q times X squared in terms of, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, these QI here in, in, in the, the coefficients of the uh, binomials. And um, yeah, so what, what you get here is, for instance, um, oh, the, the, yeah, Q1 is uh, one times Q and Q2 is two times Q and uh, the uh, other QKs are, 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 
uh, the, the coefficients are, are zero. And these you can you know, compute ahead of time and just hardwire um, in, in your system. And that's actually um, an yeah, interesting um, um, problem to, to compute them. Yeah, I had to ask on, on mass overflow. There's like an old paper called arrangement on, uh, Arrangements on Chessboards or something. It was um, um, yeah, quite, quite funny. So they are, yeah, they're related to Sterling numbers uh, of the second kind or something. Um, but yeah, so you, you can compute them um, um, ahead of time and then plug them in there. But that, th these constraints are kind of like different from um, w w what you have in, in the network flow. Um, but they are at least, the, these coefficients are always um, natural numbers. So you don't get any, you know, um, 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 rationals there. So in, in practice, yeah, the um, constraints are solved very, very quickly. Um, um, uh, by CLP and, and CPLEX, um, LP solve is slow. Um, I think it has some like nonlinear behavior in, in solving those. Probably some, you know, good preprocessing. I would assume that CPLEX and CLP do on, on, on these network kind of constraints. Um, so if you have like a large program, you know, a few hundred lines of code, and you look for um, 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 bounds of like a higher degree, say three or four, uh, then you can get fairly large constraint systems. You know, like one million constraints. Um, um, that's about the the, the ballpark. And um, uh, yeah, solving then takes one minute. And interestingly. Um, uh, that's about the time the solver needs to read in the, the constraints from a file. If you would give it to a file, that's not what, 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 what we do, but um, um, the, the solving is almost instantaneously. And it takes about as much time as like generating these constraints as it takes for like solving them. So um, yeah, we are really impressed by the, by the um, LP solvers that work really, really well. Um, so, um, Okay, so that's uh, uh, all I have. So um, yeah, I talked about this um, um, automatic amortized resource analysis that, that we developed. Um, it's very precise, um, um, as I hope uh, I have demonstrated, because like the bounds are these uh, multivariate resource polynomials that, that we developed that are very good at you know describing um, precisely the cost of uh, your programs. Um, we use this LP solving; it's efficient. Um, we have a, a form of soundness proof with respect to cost semantics, and you can even take the type derivation and ship it with your program as a certificate of, of uh, the bound. And we talked about non-polynomial um, bounds. Garbage collection is still an open problem. Um, concurrency um, and um, hardware models, that's something we, we work on. And there's a, a web interface online, so if you want to try the analysis, you know, you can go there, type in some programs, and, and um, analyze them. Thank you. Questions for you? So, so now that you have this uh, ability to sort of give a, a worst case bound for a program, can you then say, do sort of like a what if scenario of imagine that uh, there was some property of my inputs I thought ought to be true. And so I'd like to know yeah. how does that worst case bound change, you know, on input subject to this condition? So I guess you could maybe model that as sticking a beginning part in the program that just knocks out inputs that don't satisfy that condition and saying what's the new worst case? Yeah. Is it reasonable to, 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 to be reasonable to do something like that, to use this to then say, you know, be able to take a worst case bound and say if I, if, if I would be so lucky as input satisfy such and such, how would that change yeah. in the worst case subject to that? Yeah, so basically what you um, have to do is you have to, you know, combine the analysis with some, you know, technique for reasoning about functional properties, you know. Um, and we did that already a little bit. Um, um, so the question was kind of like, can you have some, um, you know, constraints on your input and then maybe get, you know, better bounds than, you know, what you would get for like all possible inputs to your, to your program. And the answer is uh, yes, that, that, that's indeed very helpful and sometimes it's even necessary. So we have a, a version of this analysis here. I was just talking about the functional case because I think it's a bit more interesting with these data structures and so on. But like for the work we do, for instance, for DARPA, um, we have to work with like low level code, mainly, you know, like with uh, derived integer bounds and so on. And there already we need constraints on, on the integers to get a bound. So for instance, to give you a simple example, um, uh, what, what, what we usually do is we assign potential to intervals um, between the, the integers. And then here the list gets smaller and you get out the potential, you can use it. And there um, you want to know that the interval gets smaller. 
But if the interval is already zero, right, you, you don't get anything out. So you need to have this information that you know, x is greater than y so that you get something out of this interval. Otherwise, the analysis does not work. Um, to come back to your question, if it's, I'm not sure if I know an, an example that we have. Yeah, maybe there are like a, a few where you even get like, where you, where you can get a bound. And then if you have some logical constraint, you get a better bound. I think that exists too for these integer programs. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. I don't know how to do that for the functional programs in a, in a systematic way. So these are for programs running in isolation, that is, they're not contending with other programs for resources and so on? Do, 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 would you, could you apply some of these techniques or extend these techniques to that situation? Yeah, so, I mean, it's, I, we tried that a little bit, but it's um, very, very challenging in the sense that, like, the worst case that you have um, in, in these situations is usually very bad. And, um, um, and so, so that's you know, maybe another connection to the workshop. So that's then usually not so interesting in terms of, of bounds that you get. So we applied that a little bit to these um, log-free log -free data structures. Um, but we mainly, um, so these are like data structures you know, that um, um, uh, people use um, um, to, to you know, access, uh, access share, shared data without getting a log before. And um, so there, um, um, mainly the goal was to prove that they make progress. But we did that basically by deriving bounds, but the bounds were, um, were relatively useless. So what we try to do now is, so there's like a, a line of work in, in programming languages called session types. So Frank Fanning is, is doing that. So this is kind of like a way where you specify the um, interaction of two programs um, uh, very precisely. You say like, okay, you, you send me this, then I get that, and then I send you this. And in, in, in this way, with, with kind of like types. And this seems to be a very promising approach. If you have this session type, then you can say like, okay, you know, uh, I, I, I send you X in, you know, within five seconds, then you send me Y um, after 10 seconds. And in this way, I think we hopefully can get some, something useful in, if, if more information is available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can think of it like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, when can this kind of analysis be done statically? Is it for maybe for straight line programs in general, or beyond, or do you need to always do this dynamically? Oh no, no. This is all um, what, what, what I showed is all statically. I so th this is uh, this is a static analysis. So, so the only thing we did dynamically with the machine learning was to to get a, a high level cost semantics once, once and for all. So then you know, you know your average addition costs you know, um, 11 clock cycles. And from there, you know, we can you know, get, you, get, get you bounds for, 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 for new programs totally automatically. Of course, not for all programs, you know, but for the ones I showed, um, it works, for instance. And it's also um, fairly intuitive, I would say, for a user. Um, who uses the system for a while, so it's not an, an arbitrary heuristic. Um, 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 so you, you get a feel for what works and what doesn't work, and it's pretty transparent, actually. So that's also something that's nice about it. But of course, it's not a cyber problem. And it's, it's hard to answer the question for what programs it, it works and, and what not, so. Yeah. So let's take further questions offline so we still get a break. So thanks, Jan, again.